I'm Terry Lacona. I've been the producer of Austin City Limits uh, for the past 17 years, since 1979. And uh, basically, this is my first job in TV. I know that surprises a lot of people, but considering that I've got a college degree in history and my background before this was in radio, I think people should be surprised when they hear that. I moved to Austin in 1974 after working in upstate New York for eight years doing everything you can think of in radio. I came down here because of the Austin music scene and because of the weather. So with a little bit of perseverance, in other words, being a pain in the neck, I talked my way into a part-time job with KLRN doing some public affairs type TV work. And as fate would have it, the very month that I moved to Austin was the same time that they taped the original pilot of Austin City Limits. I had no idea at the time, I had no idea what it, what it was all about, except that it was a music show and that in itself interested me. My name is Gary Minotti, I'm the director of Austin City Limits. Um, I've been working on the show for 19 years and directing for the past 13 years. Um, my interest in the show came about as being a student at the University of Texas and working for the PBS station, which just happened to be producing this show at the time. And through time, I've evolved into the position I am now, just from dedication. Hi, I'm Bob Selby, and uh, I'm the lighting director for Austin City Limits. Uh, I've uh, been doing Austin City Limits for 20 years, plus a couple of years prior to that when we did the pilots that we did for it. I'm David Huff. I'm the audio director for Austin City Limits. I've been working on the show since uh, the pilot, which was over 20 years ago. And um, I suppose I got involved because I came from it as a musician and an electrical engineer from UT. I just sort of jumped into this right out of graduating from UT, and I've been doing this ever since. To make a long story short, within about a year's time, I had volunteered myself as a part-time assistant to the producer, the then producer of Austin City Limits, uh, for free. And they were looking for all the uh, able bodies and part-time help that they could find. And little did I know that within another year, the producer, the director, and the executive producers of Austin City Limits back then split the scene and went off in different directions to pursue other, other careers or other work. And all of a sudden, I went from being a volunteer assistant to the producer to being the ranking senior staff person for Austin City Limits. And I know an opportunity when I see one, and I decided once again to be a pain in the neck and try to push my way into the producer's job because I was the only one who had any experience. And I was able to con the uh, general manager of the station back then into giving me a shot at it. And so the rest is history, as they say, but uh, I've been the full-time producer since then, and I'm very glad of it. It's always been an important part of our philosophy from day one to showcase new music and artists who otherwise wouldn't get that kind of exposure on national television anywhere. Uh, people like Lyle Lovett, of course, and Nancy Griffith, and George Strait, but even Vince Gill and, and other artists who aren't generally associated with the Austin music scene, a lot of them really got their feet wet, so to speak, or their first TV exposure on our show. I don't think there's any secret or s magic formula to Austin City Limits success over the last 20 years, but if there is anything about the show that really stands out as sort of our trademark, it's the fact that the music is what counts. It's music pure and simple. There are no gimmicks. There's no BS, uh, 
there, there is not the usual hype that goes along with music the way it's presented on commercial TV. And the fact that there are no commercials, I think more than perhaps anything, sets us apart from all of the other music shows on TV. Uh, we don't mess with the integrity of, of the music. Uh, you really do get the feeling like you're at a concert in a front row seat, as I like to say, and, uh, and a chance to really relate to the music in, in an intimate one-on-one -on -one way. There were a couple of things that we did to commemorate our 20th anniversary. We didn't uh, do anything really spectacular for the simple reason that we don't have the budget to, to do anything uh, really special. So we decided to incorporate uh, what we called flashbacks into most of the programs for this 20th anniversary season, which basically is two or three minutes worth of a highlight from an older show. So for instance, uh, when Vince Gill did the show, we we showed a two-minute clip of him when he was with pure prairie league, long shoulder-length hair, acting like a, guitar, a rock guitarist from 1979. Um, Nancy Griffith, uh, for her new show this year, we had a flashback to her first show from 10 years ago when she had uh, this unknown singer named Lyle Lovett as a backup singer. We didn't even credit him or mention him by name on that show. Nobody knew who he was. On the, uh, the show this year with the Mavericks, we showed a clip of Roy Orbison singing Crying, which of course made perfect sense because of the comparisons between Raul, the Mavericks lead singer, and Roy. And uh, one entire show for this season coming up, which will air in April, is going to be a Stevie Ray retrospective with uh, the highlights from the two shows that Stevie Ray appeared on on Austin City Limits. Stevie Ray Vaughan's first show was uh, from season nine. And then he, his final appearance just before he died was season 15 and as part of the tribute that we did to W.C. Clark, his friend and mentor. So that's going to be a whole hour of nothing but Stevie Ray's music. And I have to say that of all the shows that we've done, the one show that people ask about the most is Stevie Ray Vaughan. We get more calls asking if there are, are tapes available that people can buy, and unfortunately there are not. But uh, those, those are the things that we're doing to celebrate our 20th season. Again, uh, nothing spectacular, but I think those are the kinds of things that people appreciate the most. It took a while to get recognized with it. I mean, uh, there were times where the audience was, uh, you know, half filled in there, and we'd pull people off the streets to try to get them to come in. But uh, with its longevity and staying on PBS, it's become very popular. and getting a lot of recognition now. And this being the 20th anniversary, uh, just I guess it just speaks for itself. As far as booking the talent, uh, that's Terry Lacona, the producer. He, um, he will be the one that books the talent. He always comes across with some good talent. People expect when they tune in and watch Austin City Limits on Saturday night that the shows are happening right then and there. In fact, uh, we've had a lot of calls from people this year asking, can they get tickets to come see Vince Gill or whomever? And we have to disappoint when we say, well, that show was taped back in September of last year and it's in the can and you've missed it. But if you tune in, you'll be able to watch it and, and enjoy it even that much more. But generally, all of our shows are taped in our studio here between July and December. And then they begin to air as part of each season's new, new presentation beginning in January. And then the new season runs from January through April. And then there's a little bit of a gap in between when we sometimes pursue other projects. But generally, if you want to come and see an actual taping, the time to come is between July and December. Well, uh, it starts in pre-production where the, uh, excuse me, the producer and I will uh, sit and talk about uh, the talent that we want on the show and uh, changes that we want from made on the set or, or um, a different look that we want from the cameras. Um, and then it evolves into the actual production itself, which uh, on a taping day as it is today, we'll um, have a rehearsal in the afternoon and take a break uh, 
for dinner and then continue and the show starts at 8 o'clock at night and we roll tape just as if it was a concert and capture what the uh, artist is, com what's coming off the stage from the artist. What happens is uh, the artist uh, will come up with a set list of the songs they're going to sing that night. Um, and for my edification and for every, all the other technicians' edification, they will run through those songs. So uh, for my part, I write down who does what during the song. Um, if the singer is singing, then that's what the, the note I'll make for the camera shot that I want. If there's a solo, then I'll make that note for the camera operators later on for when the show actually is uh, playing will go down the list and hopefully they'll play the same thing that we played in the afternoon they won't change anything so meaning that uh, all the camera shots are in order if they do the same thing that they did in rehearsal sometimes they throw us curves each year we reevaluate uh, the lighting we've done in the past and try to update it a little bit to solve any kind of problems that we've seen in past years and, and have a general overall lighting uh, setup, which we then uh, alter individually to help uh, maximize the use of the lights for each individual program. And uh, we tend to uh, change the backlight colors based on the type of music that's happening on the stage for that particular performance so that you wouldn't necessarily see the same lighting for all the bands. Uh, and the design is uh, very conservative, and it's based on typical television lighting. Uh, I guess you'd say that what we're trying to do is light for television so that it gives the same effects that you would like to see for a concert when seen through the eyes of the camera. Longevity and and working around here is a is a is a big deal. Uh, I probably have, um, or I probably work with um, ten, maybe twelve people for the last fifteen years solid, and those are people in key positions. Uh, the audio director David Huff, who's been here since the beginning. Um, most of the camera operators uh, have been here for that 15 years, if not right at 15 years, or longer, some of them. Uh, each day when we come in to uh, modify the lighting, we have a crew of three people plus myself that do those changes. And we usually have a four-person crew at the beginning of each season to, uh, to set up the lights the first time we are going out to do the first show. I can show you a little bit about what's around the room here. We've got uh, a 36 channel audio console here that brings in all the microphones that are on stage and those microphones um, are spread around the stage in order to collect the sounds from all the individual instruments, drums, keyboards, vocal mics, bass, and, and all of that. Brought in here and uh, do a little treble and bass adjustment on that and combine the sounds together to a multi-track uh, two inch 24 track back here so that we can uh, at least get everything on onto tape in the first pass. The room is for the real trick. It's the, uh, the way it was, the way the architects designed it and the acoustical treatment out there uh, has sound absorption out there. The audience absorbs the sound. It has very much the same acoustical characteristics as being outdoors, but there's no wind. The toughest question and the hardest answer is how do you get tickets to the shows? The shows have become so popular, the tickets are like gold, even though they're free. We could probably sell them for a lot of money if we wanted to and if the university rules permitted it. I'm sure they probably are sold on the black market. I wouldn't be surprised, although I have no knowledge of that. I, I would expect it to be the case. But the best way to, to find out when the tickets are going to be distributed is to call the main number here at KLRU, which is 471-4811, and we have a hotline. We have a hotline here at the television station which has updated information on what our taping schedule is and when shows are uh, coming up. 
then your best bet is to listen to the local radio. If it's a country act, then we'll announce on KVET and Case FM on the day the tickets are being distributed. If it's a uh, AAA act or uh, blues or rock or some other style, we'll announce it on either KUT or KGSR. We try to mix it up and, and give other radio stations an opportunity to be the official outlet. And then the tickets are all distributed first come, first serve from the lobby of, uh, of KLRU here at 26 in Guadalupe. So all in all, I have five cameras. Three of them are on pedestals that move across the floor and give you these nice dolly shots back and forth, or trucking shots, whichever way you're going. Uh, I have one handheld camera that gets behind the drums or at the keyboards on top, the, the limited angles that you can't get from the other four cameras. And the, f and the fifth one would be the crane that gives me the overhead view look, which, uh, like I call the cheap seats, uh, you know, the old baseball game looking through the fence at everybody else inside the game. Uh, but it gives that overall big feeling look that you're outdoors in uh, a concert setting, and it, it's an establishing shot is what it is. We have tried to maintain a certain look to Austin City Limits over the years, and so uh, we we kind of have an idea that it looks pretty much the way we want it to look. And uh, it's not quite as flashy as our live performances that you see most days, you know, uh, today because it's, it's not quite rock and roll lighting. It's more, a little more conservative than that. Everybody uh, assumes that we are outside unless they really have seen it, and everyone assumes that the space is much larger than it really is. The idea is to try to get, capture the excitement of the sound and, and get that compressed down to where it, you can hear it through a little speaker, all the way up to a large stereo surround speaker. So it's kind of a challenge to, to be able to get a mix that works everywhere. There, I run three tapes at a time. And one of those tapes, it's a switch feed where the cameras are switched through the, uh, through the switcher here. Actually, another person does that. And that tape is built, it's called a primary tape. And at the same time, I'm running isolation tapes that have the same time, the same sync of uh, the other shots that I can edit in later on to that primary tape. And those are shots of the drums, those are shots of the wide shot or whatever it be, audience shots, whatever. And uh, after the video guys go off and do their editing, then uh, we come back into the room, reload the 24 track and put a mix together with the ability to be able to work on that song over and over again, back, back and forth, rewinding and you know, touching on uh, all the little types of reverbs and EQs, getting everything balanced. And this show is unique in that we're able to put quite a bit of time into the into working on the show. Fortunately, this show is built so that, our, that uh, uh, this, the music itself runs pretty much in real time, straight through, uh, but we we're able to pick which songs we use. If there's ever an edit, it's usually during applause. And some songs are, you know, don't have applause on them, so we have to tag just a couple of seconds worth on there to smooth, smooth that out, to give it the appearance that it's a live show. And it is a live show. David Ball is in many ways a quintessential Austin City Limits type artist. Uh, the fact that uh, his roots in many ways are tied to the Austin music scene. And he appeared on the show 15 years ago as part of Uncle Walt's band, which was a great classic show, classic Austin City Limits type performance. And then when Uncle Waltz just couldn't find acceptance in the commercial marketplace, uh, David and Walter Hyatt, two of the three founding members, went on to Nashville. It took a long time after that, but David finally has gotten the attention and the success that he's so richly deserved. David is one of many examples of artists, uh, not only Austin-based, but just artists in general who I think got some of their first national exposure on our show. It's always been an important part of our philosophy from day one 
to showcase new music and artists who otherwise wouldn't get that kind of exposure on national television anywhere. Uh, people like Lyle Lovett, of course, and Nancy Griffith and George Strait, but even Vince Gill and, and other artists who aren't generally associated with the Austin music scene, a lot of them really got their feet wet, so to speak, or their first TV exposure on our show. Uh, I, I really wished I could pinpoint one favorite show, but uh, I happen to be a fan of just about all of them. People ask, well, who's never done the show who you would like to get? Bob Dylan is somebody who I have tried and will continue trying, and I feel like I'm actually closer to getting him to do it than ever before. Joni Mitchell is somebody else again from that same era. We came this close to getting Joni Mitchell to do the show this year to promote her new album. In fact, she wanted to do it. She is a huge fan of the show, I found out. But her schedule just wouldn't, wouldn't permit. I'd like to do another songwriter show for season 21. Uh, I'm completely open to ideas at this point, but that's a concept that has always been popular with our audiences, and so I think maybe uh, this coming season would be time to do uh, yet another. I try to keep an open mind and all of my options open as late as possible because you never know who's going to come along, who the latest, hottest act will be from Austin or from anywhere these days. So although I'm very happy and proud of, of what we've accomplished for this 20th season, Next year could even be better. In my mind, he's a woman. My heart keeps the longing to be home in an Austin, Texas bar.